Good morning. It's awfully quiet this morning. Boy. Social media must be really interesting. What's happening tomorrow in grass? Nothing, right? Because campus is closed. And if you have Monday classes, there's no Monday classes either, right? So it's four day weekend. Uh, yes, I mean, homework is still due on Saturday. Uh, but I got to keep you on track because when is your chapter six homework due? Tuesday. What are we doing on Tuesday? Reviewing, right? For your exam that takes place next Thursday on chapters four, five, and six. So, in a lot of ways, it's crunch time. I wrote down, kind of at the beginning of this chapter, this statement about how we are going to conserve energy, right? And I just want to be really clear here and talk about the problem solving process because we're going to do lots of examples today about what goes into all these different parts. Let's, let's start with the right hand side, this energy final, energy initial. So this, the final and initial, Right means that what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at where an object is to begin with, like we know some information about it, and then there'll be another point in its motion where we want to find something out, okay? And that's all that matters. And, and part of, I think part of the difficulty of conservation of energy in a lot of people's minds when they first see it is understanding that it's only those two points that really matter. If you can give up on what happens in between, you'll be in good shape. What do I mean by that? This final energy, the kinds of energy this thing could have at some point in its motion, it could be kinetic, right? It could be potential, and so we want to ask the question, right? Does it have kinetic energy at its final point? Does it have potential energy at its final point? How do we know? Same thing down here. This could be kinetic energy or it could be potential energy. We, we have to ask those questions. So usually we're gonna put like little Fs and little I's on these things to keep track, right? Uh, you might see me every once in a while slip up and put like a, 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 a sub-zero, the not, like V not, right? That means initial also. Your book uses this symbology. And then, and then there's everything else, <laughs> okay? If, we, if it's not one half mv squared, and it's not mgh, so mgh for gravitational potential energy, one half mv squared for if the object is moving. If it's anything else, we're gonna throw it into the circular file that is work non-conservative. It's our catch-all term for anything else that's happening in the problem we can't keep track of. Usually, friction. I mean, friction always ends up in this work non-conservative site. But there can also be other things like, um, like, uh, like an engine pushing a car or thrust pushing a rocket or uh, a skateboarder pushing on the ground. Like, like we know that you know, if you push on the ground while riding a skateboard, you're going you're gonna to get some kinetic energy, right? You're going to go from not having any energy to having some energy. Where did that energy come from? Well, it came from a non-conservative work term, okay, that took place and the skateboarder pushed off the ground. We don't have, like, a potential energy of a skateboarder pushing off the ground, right? All we have is gravitational potential energy and then the energy something has while it's moving. Everything else, and you know, and, and this 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 list just keeps going. So if you don't know how to handle it, ch chuck it over there. If as long as it's not mgh or one half mv squared. So with that refresher in place, let's start doing some examples. And I'm gonna go straight for one that has been causing you a lot of high blood pressure. I mean, hopefully by now it's getting a little bit uh, reflexive, right? Whenever you see a hill, in physics we call it the inclined plane, right? It's just this, it, it, it's such a useful shape for so many things, from stairs to wheelchair ramps to hills to loading ramps to kids sliding down snow-covered hills. 
we're gonna we're gonna tackle exactly this. What was it? A tungsten cube, I think. Sliding down an inclined plane. Now, now before, okay. So what we're gonna what we're gonna ask, okay, is how fast, right? Um, the, the question is, what is v final, right? If this thing uh, slides down the hill, we're gonna know that the angle is 40 degrees, okay? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm reading the wrong question. We're not gonna ask how fast. We are gonna ask, what is the coefficient of friction between the surface of the hill and the tungsten cube as it slides? If the hill is 40 degrees, we know that the final speed is 28 meters per second when it gets to the bottom. It starts with an initial speed of zero, and we know that the entire length that this thing slides, so this distance right here, the, the, the length of the slide, is 100 meters. Okay. So this isn't the, the height, the vertical height, it's the length of the hill. So if we were to do this, if we were to go back to chapter four, We'd have to start this by drawing a free body diagram, right? Picking an axis, deciding what direction the acceleration is, writing down Newton's second law in the x and y directions. Uh, we'd end up with a fun equation because we'd need the normal force because friction's involved, but it's also horizontal. Da, 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 da. And then we'd have like three equations with three unknowns in it to solve, and we'd eventually get to right. We've done that. We've done that. And it gets horrible really fast. So I'm not gonna do that again. You've got that in your notes. What I wanna do is show you how to do, oh, <laughs> and that wouldn't even get us. So <laughs> if we did this with Newton's second law, we'd have to do the kinematic equations to find out what the acceleration of this thing was, right? We know initial speed, we know final speed, we know the distance it went. So we'd have to use the third kinematic equation because we didn't have time just to get the acceleration so that we could put that into the Newton's. This is bad. But let's do it with energy. Let's see what happens when we try this with our newfound conservation of energy idea. So what do you do for a visualization? Like how do you start organizing information? I usually draw a picture. Okay, somewhat similar to what I would do maybe in a chapter four. Um, there are forces involved here. We're going to, have to take a look at that. So it won't be a strict free body diagram, but I might I might want to like make sure I understand right what forces are involved here. So just just real quickly, and it doesn't hurt to do this, even though you might not need any of these things. It just doesn't hurt, right, to just throw in the forces that you know have to be there. You know there's a normal force. You know gravity's pulling this thing down. You know there's some friction. Don't bother going after the components yet. You may or may not need them. But let, you know, just, we're just orienting ourselves, right? And the free body diagram, even if we're not doing Newton's second law, can still be a very useful thing to sort of visualize and anchor on. Making lists, right, of what you know and what you don't know, I've kind of attached all of my data to my picture here. Okay, so the strategize step of this, right? And again, these aren't just, you know, do one, do the next, never get to go back, right? It's a little bit of a circle as you go back and forth between the two steps, just to make sure you've got everything. But the strategize is you write down the conservation of energy equation. This is where you start, and then you begin filling in the blanks. Right? You go through each of these terms and you ask yourself, right? do I have any work by a force that I don't know how to deal with? What is my initial point? What's my final point? Like All of these things matter. So before we start marching through all that and answering some of those questions, we do want to do one more visualization step. And this is just setting up the problem. Okay? Remember, we have initial and final on that right-hand side. We need to pick an initial and final point. There's three things you've got to do every conservation of energy problem. Where's the initial point? Where's the final point? And where are we going to define zero for gravitational potential energy? MGH, right, gravitational potential energy, depends on where we set our zero mark. 
And so we got to pick that. So first of all, uh, initial point. Is there a point here that just sort of jumps out at you as to where this object either starts or we know something about it? <laughs> On top of the hill, right? Okay. It, it was just kind of given to us, right? The initial speed of this thing is zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here. I'm going to write an I and I'm just going to circle it. Or maybe you draw an arrow and say, this is my initial point. You want to, you want to nail that point down. Okay. And then is there a point somewhere where we know something at the end? And at the bottom, right? They gave us information that it's going 28 meters per second at the bottom, right? So I'm going to go ahead and make that my final point. Sometimes there'll be an unknown thing at an initial or final point, and that's okay. That might be something you're looking for. We're looking for coefficient. It hasn't cropped up yet, but we'll get there. Okay, so I have my initial, I have my final. Now, third thing you want to always do is set the zero point, like your origin of coordinates, for gravitational potential energy for the point from which you're gonna measure all your heights and that sort of stuff. So this isn't in your book. I haven't really seen this on the internet, but let me give you a Mr. Balo rule of thumb. Something that like helps me keep myself organized and being consistent every single time. Kind of like the rule of thumb where you always put your coordinate system in the same direction as the acceleration to keep yourself safe from getting the wrong minus signs. Pick the zero point as the lowest point in the problem. It may not be where your initial or final is. It usually is, okay? but it could be separate from where your initial or final point is. But always pick the lowest point given in the problem. Where's the lowest point given in this problem? At the bottom, or at the bottom of the hill, right? So I usually, like, what I'll do is I'll draw a dotted line, right, and I'll say that's my zero, okay? Like I'm just, this, this point, right, this entire horizontal line, that's where zero elevation is. Okay, so in the setup we want a picture and on that picture you're going to want initial, final, and a zero point, right? Sort of as a bare minimum to be able to be successful with this. All right, let's, let's tackle uh, parts of our energy equation here. Uh, what do you, you want to handle? For, uh, pick and choose. Final, initial energy, or work non-conservative. What do you want to do first? Work non conservative. That's sort of like the big unknown, isn't it? It's like, what the heck is this thing? So, what's the question you're asking here? Okay, do we have any forces where gravity is doing something? Yes, mg, right? So, we don't have to worry about that one. Okay? Uh, we have a normal force here, okay? But how much work is that normal force going to do? Be careful. Which way is the tungsten cube moving? Down the hill, which way is the normal force pointing? Perpendicular to the hill, how much work is it doing? Zero, right? Remember how we talked about work? How, remember carrying your backpack across campus was zero work? Why was that zero mechanical work? Perpendicular to the distance it's going, right? Okay, so the normal force isn't doing any work. Gravity we're gonna take care of with gravitational potential energy, which leaves one last force to deal with, the friction, okay? So, my work non-conservative, and that, the left-hand side is really a sum, like you add up all of the works from all these forces, right? I'm not gonna bother to write down the work from the normal force, because I know it's zero. So I'm just gonna say the work done by friction. I'm just gonna leave that as a symbol, we'll break down what that is, okay? But I've identified that Friction is something I've got to deal with. It's not going to be one half mv squared. It's not going to be mgh. We'll find out what it is later. Okay, uh, final energy. So the question you want to ask is two questions. Is it moving at the final point? And does it have height with respect to where you picked zero? So first question, is it moving at the final point? Does this thing have speed at the final point? Yeah, it's moving at 28 meters per second, right? So that means it's going to have a kinetic energy final. That's not going to be a zero, right? Okay. And then what about its potential energy at that point? I'm going to write this out in full. You can do this over and over again if you want to. But really this side 
can, it is, you know, you take your kinetic energy final and your potential energy final. That would be your total final energy. Minus your kinetic energy initial plus your potential energy initial. We're just going to go through and ask ourselves, are any of these zero? So is it moving at the final? Yes, I can't cross out kinetic energy final. But what is its height at the final point? It's zero, isn't it? So that means that I can say, right, the potential energy is zero because the height is zero. I usually cross it out and then give a reason for why I crossed it out. That way I come back later and <laughs> figure out what mistake I made. Okay, and then we do the same questions but at the initial point. Is it moving at the initial point? What is its speed at the initial point? Zero. Zero. So does it have any kinetic energy? No. So I'll just cross it out and say that the initial is equal to zero. Okay. And then what about its potential energy? Does it have height with respect to our zero level? It sure does. It's above it, isn't it? Okay. So I can't cross that one out. Okay. So... Largely, everything that I've got on the screen so far is, is concept, right? I'm writing down symbols, but I haven't really done any math. I'm conceptually laying out the things that I have and the things that I don't need to think about anymore because they're going to turn out to be zero. Okay, work done by friction. What, what is work in general? Remember the definition? Force times the distance, right? And then there's usually like a cosine theta along for the ride, okay? But I usually don't like to have that on there. Um, so um, work done by friction. Um, the force that this work does, okay, is the force of friction, isn't it? Whatever that is. The distance that it travels, d, is going to be the 100 meters. That's the total distance that friction acted. But there's one more thing I have to remember. This, what kind of friction is this? It's kinetic friction. And what direction does kinetic friction act compared to the direction of motion? Opposite. So what does that mean to the work is? It's negative work. Whenever you've got kinetic friction in your problem, it is going to be doing negative work, meaning it's taking energy out of our system it's taking mechanical energy out of our system that we really can't keep track of other than in this work non-conservative sense. Okay, so that handles, so, so work, FD cosine theta, if you really wanna be technical about it, the angle between the distance and the friction is 180 degrees. So that's where our minus sign comes from. All right, kinetic energy, what's, uh, what's mathematically, what's kinetic energy? It's one half and the, in this case, final squared, plus zero minus, and then I got a minus a potential. What's uh, mathematically, what's potential energy? MGH. Okay. And then I sit here and I go, okay, there, are there things that I know and things that I don't know in this statement and what the heck am I looking for? So do I know the force of friction? Nope. Uh, do I know D, the distance that the object traveled? 100 meters. Uh, do I know the mass of the object? Nope. Uh, do I know V final? Yep. Do I know, I don't know the mass. Do I know what planet I'm on? Sure, it's Earth. And then do I know the height? No. Oh my gosh. That's a lot of unknown things, isn't it? So we got to start figuring out what this stuff is. Uh, let's do it in reverse. Uh, can I find the height? Can I find the vertical height that uh, this object starts from zero? Sure. I've got a triangle, right? I need, I need this distance right here. So I have a triangle where the hypotenuse is 100, this angle is 40, and I want to know that side. Sine or cosine? Sine. Why is it sine? It's not touching the angle. So that height is going to be 100 sine 40 degrees. You're welcome. Touching, not touching. It just always works. It just always works. So now I know what my height is. It, it's whatever that number turns out to be. 
40 degrees. Okay. Um, ooh, mass can't do much with at this point. Let's let's ignore that. Uh, let's let's tackle this friction, this frictional force. Do we know anything about this frictional force? What was it? Thought I heard it. No. The pun. Come on. Fun. Right. Frictional forces are fun. They're not really, but we'll just keep saying it until we can convince ourselves, right? Oh, and there's the mu, right? I found the mu that I was after in this problem. So this is minus mu times n times d. Okay. Um, but I now have introduced a new problem. Uh, what's my normal force? Zero. Oh, not zero. Can I find my normal? Is there something... That I can do maybe from chapter four could help me find my normal force. MG. Close to mg, it's on an incline. mg cosine theta. <laughs> How often does that come up? The normal force is equal to mg cosine theta. For something on an incline, the normal, unless there's another vertical force pushing on it, and we won't do that to you, um, the normal force will be mg cosine theta. So what, is, what does this leave me with here? This is minus mu, and then I substitute n, which is mg cosine theta times d. I'm just substituting stuff in now. And then I'm 1 half mv final squared minus mg H. Okay, now what have I got? Uh, ooh, ooh! What's in every term everywhere? Yeah, the mass is in every term. Oh, I don't need the mass. So this works for elephants, mice, or tungsten cubes. Okay, I don't know mu, but it's something that I want to find. Right, that's the unknown thing I'm looking for. Uh, I know the angle, I know my distance, I know what one half is, I know what my V final is, I know what planet I'm on, and I know my height. What do I do now? <laughs> I just, this is algebra from this, this point forward, right? Okay. Um, let's see here, a little bit of algebra. Let's, uh, well, let's do positive minus positive and flip that sign. Uh, g cosine theta O times D gets divided into everything over here. And I'm pretty sure that now takes care of what mu is. Mu is going to be a mess, but it's this thing. It's, uh, it's G H minus one half V final square all over G D cosine theta. I can go ahead and throw numbers into this. Uh, I never found out what my height was. Um, it's uh, 100 sine 40 degrees. I never found out what the number was. 20, 28 squared uh, over 9.8 times 100 times the cosine of 40 degrees. And when I put all of that into my calculator, wrestle with it for a long time, and fix some syntax errors. 8.32. Now, you compare what's on the screen now to what your notes say about what happened back in chapter four. I know this is the first time you're seeing something like this, but I would contend that this actually has fewer steps and fewer opportunities for making mistakes. There's still, the devil's very much in the details in physics class, isn't it? They keep trying to tell you that really it's the same problem over and over again. You keep telling me, no, Mr. Baylor, they're all different, <laughs> right? But we're still visualizing, we're still strategizing. It's just the way that we do those things changes and you do have to practice that. But if we can identify an initial final and a zero point for height, and then conceptualize our way through what each of these terms needs to be, the math actually is a lot easier and 
than you'll get in from Newton's laws. Newton's laws usually ends up with multiple equations with multiple unknowns and having to wade into an algebra jungle. Now, you might be happier doing that. That's perfectly fine. Right? But conservation of energy can pull off some really, really neat tricks that with Newton's laws would be a lot harder. But I can tell that there's a little bit of like hesitation in your brain. Like, like there's, a, there's a piece of you that doesn't believe, right, that this can possibly work. And so I want to do a demonstration that will hopefully make you a believer in conservation of energy. says I'm not supposed to go any higher. If I threw this at your face, go ahead, hold on to it. Would you like it if I threw that at your face? No, no, okay. Just making sure, right? Some people. Uh, would you go ahead, please? Okay. Stay right there. All right. So, this is a pendulum, right? And what do pendulums do? They swing back and forth. I made sure it wasn't good. All right, so what kind of energy does this pendulum have right here at this point? Potential energy, right? Okay, and that potential energy gets turned into what kind of energy when I let go? Kinetic energy, so that at its lowest point, it's going to have the most kinetic energy it can ever have. This could be zero. We say it's zero potential energy. It all got turned into kinetic energy. But then this kinetic energy turns into what? Potential energy over here, doesn't it? And then it does it all over again. Potential to kinetic, kinetic to potential, forever and ever and ever, right? So, if I hold this up like this, and I make you step forward, put your nose kind of right next to it, okay, right, okay, right? And I let go. Anything to worry about? Are you sure? You know, so sure. <laughs> A little bit, okay. Right. Trust me. You trust me? Okay. Right? You, don't have, you don't have to worry about a thing. Then why doesn't Camaria have to worry about anything? Conservation of energy. What does that mean? We can't get any more energy into the system than it starts with, right? So this thing cannot come back any higher than when it started. It's like a real test of faith here, isn't it? Okay. Right? If you're going to flinch, flinch backwards. All right, all right. Go. <laughs> Give her a hand, everybody. <laughs> All right. I always like to do this too. Okay, but I'm gonna do it a little bit, a little bit differently here. First of all, I'm actually gonna shove my face into the ball. So we'll get this ball nice and cleaned up here kill everything that's on it. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna like really like push this thing into my face, okay? And I'm gonna close my eyes. 
Not because I'm chicken, but because closing my eyes, what happens to my knowledge of where my head is in space when I close my eyes? Ooh, all of a sudden, my primary sense for knowing where my head is in space is gone. And there's a backup system in your head for when your eyes aren't working. What's the backup system for knowing where your head is in space? Anybody know? It's the inner ear, okay? There's a structure in the inner ear that actually has X, Y, and Z axes in it, and they're filled with fluid. And wherever the fluid goes, kind of tells you. But it's low definition. Your eyes are like 8K definition, right? But the one inside your head is like watching an old-fashioned television from the 70s. And you really, you can't get the little micro movements. It can be very difficult when your eyes are closed. Your eyes are open, you can know exactly where you're at. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close my eyes, so I'm not going to know if my head moves. Little bits, right? I'm going to push it right in there, right? And we're going to see, right, if the dentist is going to get some money today. No pushing. Right? Because if they push, that's extra energy, right? And my eyes will be closed. But I'll know. Come on, let's bring it back again. Here we go. I knew it was going to come back. How did I know it wasn't even going to come back and hit my face? What does this system have in it that will eventually steal the potential of kinetic energy away? Not gravity. <laughs> Not tension. Air resistance. Yeah, there's resistance in here. There's friction in here. There's friction from the air. There's friction from the rubbing of the metal things up there, right? Gravity is contained in MGH. It's perfectly conservative. This tension is always perpendicular to the direction that this thing is going. So is it doing any work? No, right? But it's, it's the air friction that is going to cause this thing not come back as high as when it started, and eventually stop, right? Okay. Again, if I die, clap this one. Let's do another example. <clears throat> I wanted to do an example that shows you several things. Number one, how to do like a vertical problem. Number two, what happens when you have multiple forces that are going on in a problem where you have work non-conservative, right? Um, don't panic. Like I know you're still like, you're just kind of looking at the problem. You're still trying to ingest it. We'll walk through it together. Take a step back and remember like our process. Visualize, strategize, do it, check it, right? So in the visualization, what are the three things that we want to make sure we identify? Initial, final, and where zero is, right? So whatever is going on in the problem, we want to be able to do that. So with that in mind, right, with this concept and idea that I'm going to draw a picture or make a list or do something that orients me to what's going on in the problem, I'm, I'm, I want to do it in such a way that I can identify initial final and some sort of zero point. So what's going on? A skydiver jumps out of a balloon at 1,000 meters. So I've got some point where the skydiver jumps, right? Okay. And it doesn't say, but I'm going to assume that they like just step out of the balloon or something like that. Like they, they start at rest, right? Okay. And, and they start falling, right? So skydiver falls. Okay. And they, they fall. They're a thousand meters above the ground, right? But then something special happens at 200 meters, right? In this problem, what happens at 200 meters? Parachute opens, right? 
So we know something about like before and after this parachute opens. They tell me that there's some sort of, they say it's like a, a retarding force, okay? A, a frictional force, like air friction, right? So before the parachute is open, I have an air friction that is equal to about 50 newtons, okay? And after the parachute opens, it's 3,600 newtons. I mean, like, what's a parachute supposed to do? It's supposed to slow you down, right? And how does it slow you down? Catching air, increasing the air friction, right? Because air friction will slow you down before you open the parachute. In fact, a skydiver will experience something called terminal velocity. What's terminal velocity? It's the speed at which you die. No, no, no. It's the fastest you can fall when air resistance is acting on you. In other words, there's gonna be a point where gravity pulling down on you and air resistance pushing up on you will be equal. And therefore, if those two forces are equal, what's your acceleration? It's zero. And so you're not gonna be speeding up anymore. Is this free fall? No, it's not free fall, because now we have air friction, right? And prior to this, we've been throwing air friction out, like air friction back. Ignore air friction. Air friction ne uh, uh, negligible. Please don't have to think about it. So, ooh, lots of stuff going on here. And if this were Newton's second law problem, it's like, good luck, right? Free body diagram your way out of this one. <laughs> okay? It's just, it's just bad. But it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty quick with um, Newton's or with conservation of energy. Okay, so we've kind of got this idea, we got sort of the, the problem visualized a little bit. I've got some of the numbers, right, that they've given me uh, put down on the page, attached somehow to some crazy picture I've got going on here. Um, I need to do initial, final, and zero. I can do that before I even write down my conservation of energy equation. So uh, one guess as to where we're going to put the initial point. <laughs> where they jump out of the blue, right? Where it starts. Okay, we know something about that position, we know where it is, and we know how fast the parachutist is going. Okay, now we're gonna get to argue over where we're gonna put the final point. There might be a couple of places that kind of jump out at you as to where to put the final point. The ground, so like go for the whole enchilada? I mean, that's where the parachute just ends up anyway, right? What are they asking us to find? Where the parachute, where the parach uh, no, A. Okay, what is the speed of the diver when they land on the ground? So the final point where they're asking us to find something is the ground, isn't it? So that's kind of a clue. The clue, find the speed down here I'm going to go ahead and put my final point down there. Now, the other sort of reflexive place to put it is at the 200, right? Like find out how fast they're going at the 200 point, do that problem, and then set up a new problem, right, where the 200 becomes the initial and then, you know, you get to the button. You don't have to break the problem up like that. You can do the whole enchilada. Conservation of energy can handle the whole thing. Only in science. What do I mean? So, we start with the master equation, right? And we're going to go in here and we're going to fill in the blanks, okay? With our initial. Oh, I forgot my zero. Where's the zero? We're going to put that right at the bottom, right? Lowest point in the problem. Okay, so uh, work non conservative. Do I have any friction in this problem? Yes, I have a lot, <laughs> okay? In fact, I've got two different sources of it, don't I? And so that's gonna be two non-conservative work terms. That side of the equation isn't just a single thing, it's, it's all the non-conservative work, you just throw it all in a bundle on that side, two for one. So, I'm gonna have negative the, 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 uh, might as well, this is the force of the 50 newtons, right? For the distance 
Okay, okay, here, tell you what. I'll do F1, D1 plus a minus F2, D2, where, where, where this is like F2, this is F1, right? Like I've got two different forces of air resistance acting over different distances. In fact, let's just right now, what's the distance that the first one acts? It's 800, isn't it? Because at 200, it changes, doesn't it? So 200 by 1,000 by 2. So the, so the D1 here is 800 meters, right? And now my D2 is equal to 200 meters. Okay. Uh, why are the minus signs on here? It's kinetic friction, right? It's air friction. It acts opposite the direction of motion. These forces are up, but the skydiver is moving down. Why is there a plus sign in between there? We add up all of the work that we have that's not gravity and kinetic energy, right? Okay. And if there were three sources or four sources or ten sources, we'd just be adding all those up. just happens to be that we're adding negative things together, right? Okay. Uh, final point. Is the uh, skydiver moving when they reach the ground? I mean, eventually they'll come to a stop, but what are they asking us to find? How fast are they going when they reach the ground, right? So I don't want to make that zero. <laughs> That's something I want to find. So in other words, will the skydiver have kinetic energy right before they hit the ground? Yeah, so I don't, I don't want to get rid of that. So I am going to have one half mv final squared. Okay, uh, same question. Is there any potential energy at the ground? What's the gravity, what's the height? What's the gravitational potential energy at the ground? Why is it zero? Because we said so, and right? We put zero at the lowest point in the problem, and that happened to coincide with our final point, right? So sometimes I put plus zero just to remind me that I, I thought about it, right? Minus, and then I gotta do the same thing for the energy initial. So, so this is my energy final, right? And now I gotta do the same thing in energy initial. So uh, does the skydiver have any speed when they jump? No, we're just like, you know, they're falling out of the plane, falling out of the balloon, whatever. It's not like they're being pushed or propelled or any of that kind of stuff, okay? Uh, so, so no kinetic energy. And then does the skydiver have any potential energy up there? Yes, because they're not at the zero point, right? Our initial point is not anywhere near zero. And so they're going to have MGH. So again, this whole thing right here is my energy initial. Whee! Okay. Uh, let's see. What do I know? What do I don't know? Do I know F1? Yep. Do I know D1? Yeah. Do I know F2? Yes. D2? Yes. One half I know. Mass of the skydiver? Yes, I do. Oh, nice. V final? No, but it's what I want, right? So that's okay. Do I know? And I know M, and I know G, and I know A. I got everything up, right? I just have to solve for V final. Okay. Um, that's going to be, so this is a, this is a minus MGH term over here, isn't it? Because that, that minus sign moves through. Um, so if I move that over here, it's going to end up being positive minus F2 D2 plus MGH. That, you know, I, I moved it over that way. Um, and that leaves me with one half mv final squared. So that means I need to multiply all of this by two and divide by m to get those canceled out. And then I take a square root. Have you noticed that I do algebra very quickly? I don't like it. Two over 80 minus 50 times 800 <clears throat> minus 3,600 times 200 um, plus 80 times 9.8 times 1,000. Why did I put 1,000 in for the height? That, that's where they start, right? Zero was at the ground, started up there. Right? Okay. And that should give me, it'll be plus or minus, but we're just looking for the speed, so it doesn't matter. Um, hmm. Mm, mm, I've got yes one. What is what is m only 
And does M only apply to two? Oh, oh, oh! When I when, so I had I had the one half M right there. So I'm dividing both sides by M, and that's exactly what that says right there. Yeah, it, it's it's you know it's just I could I could bring it through all those terms, or I could just leave it in front, multiplied. Mathematically, those are identical things. Um, I, I've got some uh, I got some bad news. This speed is 24.5 meters per second, which is about 50 miles an hour. If you woke up this morning, I said, you know what? Uh, you want to jump out of a plane and hit the ground at 50 miles an hour? What would you be your answer? No. Well, it depends. I'm going to test you after that. Um, yeah, that, that's, not, that's not a good day, right? So in order to not hit the ground at 50 miles an hour, we now need to do part B, right? We need to find out when should we, like at what height above the ground should we open this thing so that we don't, we hit the ground at a more sedate five meters per second or about 10 and a half miles an hour, right? 50 miles an hour, 50-50 chance of surviving that. Like it's, Maybe not even 50, like 10% like, like survival rate at 50 miles an hour, okay? But 10 miles an hour, that's normal, okay? That's just a really quick running pace. So <clears throat> how are we going to go about doing that? Well, let's, um, let's recycle. Let me, let me move. I'm going to move that answer just up there because... It is what it is. This is, this is part A's answer. Okay. For part B, um, what changes? What do, what do I now know? What do I not know? I don't know. Well, OK, specifically, I don't know two of the heights or two of the distances, right? Do I know what D2 is down here? No, I'm trying to find where, how high above the ground I'm trying, I'm trying to open this thing, right? Okay, so that means I also don't know D1. So that's a problem, okay? But I do know my final velocity. So the question becomes, does any of this setup change? Do I have any additional non-conservative works going on? No. Do I still have final velocity when I hit the ground? Yes. Do I still start somewhere above the ground? Yes. None of that stuff in the orange box has changed. So I can just reuse it. It's just I'm solving for a different thing. I'm solving for a different thing. So minus F1, D1, minus F2, D2 equals 1 half MV final squared um, uh, minus MGH. Okay, so... Uh, working in reverse. Do I know the H? Do I know how high above the ground the skydiver starts? Yeah, still a thousand, right? I know G, I know M. I now know V final. It's five. I got squared. I know the mass, I know one half. It's these D2s and D1s that are causing a problem, right? Those are two unknowns. So that means I've got to find out what one of them is at least, or you know, I, I need another relationship to help me figure out, I can't solve two unknowns and only have one equation. I need at least two equations or two relationships to be able to do this. So is there anything we know about D1 and D2? When we add them up, what do we get? We get a thousand, don't we? Whatever they, so if, if D2 turns out to be, I don't know, 700 meters, what do we know D1 is? It has to be 300, right? If it was 500 meters, it would be an even split. One's 500, the other's 500, right? So we know that whatever they are, they have to add up to 1,000. So that means I can solve this one for D1. It's going to be 1,000 minus D2. And then that D1 whoop, gets dropped right into there, and I solve for D2. It's going to be minus 
F1, and this is going to be 1,000 minus D2, minus F2, D2, 1 half MV final squared minus MGH. So I've got a, there's, there's some algebra that needs to be done here. You can put the numbers in to make it look a little bit easier, right? But basically you're going to multiply this F1 through. You're going to get all the terms that don't have D2 in it off to the other side. Factor out the D2, divide by the common factor. We've done that tons, and I'm running out of room on the screen, and there's other things I want to talk to you about today. So I'll just give you the punchline here. You want to take any guesses as to what the height needs to be? I mean, obviously it's more than 200 meters, right? But the question is, what is it? 20 meters more? Like 220? No, 20 meters Oh, below the time when they jump out of the plane? Because I'm going off like 50, or like 25 divided by like 5. five. Mm, oh, interesting. I see, I see where you're going. But, but you, would you agree that it has to be more than 200 still, right? You're, you're looking for the, like the delta, like how much more? OK. Anybody else? 300? 400? 500? I mean, earlier is you know, safer, right? This turns out to be 206 meters. Just a six meter difference between life and death. Do not try this at home. Open your parachute long before it's an issue, right? So why, why would anybody jump out of a plane with a margin of six meters? Like, like this parachute is, is gonna move six meters before they can even blink. This is your answer. This is a US Special Forces operative who is skydiving doing something called a halo jump. A halo jump is a high altitude, low opening maneuver. Just like it says in the title, they start way up high, they fall, 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 and when do they open? High altitude, low opening. And if you're looking very carefully at this picture, you can see that there is a dog strapped to that special forces unit. Yes, there are dogs in the special forces. Okay, so why would you want to do this? Well, I, I wouldn't want to do this. But talking to the individuals who have done this, this particular maneuver is used to insert special forces into places where you don't want the enemy to know that they're there. You can get the parachute to open below a mountaintop or below radar coverage so that it can't be detected, right? Why do you want a dog with you? It's a stressful environment. Having a puppy around is a good... No, right? These are very, very well-trained animals, right? Um, but yeah, um, the other question is, where's the dog's oxygen? It doesn't actually need it. It's not, <laughs> it's not at high altitude long enough for the dog to care. Um, but you definitely don't want the human being blacking out on the way down. Um, but yeah, so you can see, I don't know if you can see it, but the dog's leg <laughs> is going out that direction, right? The dog's head is muzzled in that direction. Um, <laughs> the joke goes that if you don't do a halo jump, you might be wearing a halo. Um, these parachutes are not controlled by the service member. Uh, they are controlled by computers. Okay, It's a very precise um, opening situation. And um, a lot of times there are injuries with uh, either the parachute opening and causing a very rapid deceleration because it has to. So bruising, contusions, uh, pulled muscles. Um, and then the halo jumps are responsible for most of the accidents, that casualties, not, not deaths, but just people getting hurt when they land um, because they are actually landing at a pretty big clip. When they come into the ground. Mm -hmm. 
right? It's kind of a problem. <laughs> so they train very hard uh, to be very fit and be able to land properly and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes the dogs are thrown independent of the operator. Uh, so the dog has its own parachute. Uh, and will land separately from the service member, and then they are, the dog is trained to go find that service member. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different things. There are, I've seen dogs wearing um, gas masks. Um, it, it's, it's exactly what you're picturing in your mind. Okay, muzzle, tube coming out the side of it. Um, most of the time the dogs are blindfolded, during the jump. So in other words, the muzzle or mask that they're wearing will cover their eyes so they can't see out. That's because dogs are not stupid like humans. They will not jump out of an airplane, right, um, on command. So it's pretty funny. You watch the service member. They have, there's, a, there's always like a handle on the back of the dog, right? And so they can just pick the dog up. Right? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's pretty funny. So this is a technology that is in use. All right, let's um, let's skip the quiz. I know you're disappointed, aren't you? And let's talk about power. It's the last topic we have before the end of this unit. You guys can close that door over there. Um, so, what is power? Money. No, wait, no. I actually, I, I had some fun and I went and asked the internet what power was. And there were a lot of really stupid things. But um, I have some quotes here. Uh, does anybody know who Abraham Lincoln was? Yeah, probably. Um, said in a time when the gender pronouns were always referencing men, right? But insert favorite gender pronoun in here. Nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. Ooh, that, that kind of stings, doesn't it? Right? Okay. Um, Thomas Jefferson, anybody know Thomas Jefferson? Maybe heard of him? I hope our wisdom will grow with our power and teach us that the less we use our power, the greater it will be. Author of like the Constitution. <laughs> wow. Okay. Oh, and um, okay. Then my, my favorite one. I don't even need the sheet for this one. Okay. My favorite one. I'm not going to tell you who's good, who's who's saying it. I'm going to let you guess who says this one. Okay. But unfortunately, I cannot do the voice. So you're just going to have to provide the voice in your head. Okay. For the following quote: The power to destroy a planet is insignificant when compared with the power of the force. Uh, Who said that? Darth Vader. Darth Vader, A New Hope? The original first movie? Not those prequels which in my universe didn't happen? Right? With Alderaan and they blow it up, right? Darth. You guys need to watch Star Wars. A new hope. Anyway, what's power? Power, mechanically speaking, physically speaking, is the amount of work that's done in a certain amount of time. And uh, you've, you're, you're probably familiar with the unit that power is expressed in. Um, usually it's associated with like electrical power. So what, what unit do we usually often talk about, like light bulbs and things like that? It's in watts, right? What's a watt? Well, what's work? What are the units of work? It's a joule. And what's time? Seconds. So a joule per second is called a watt. And um, so if you have a 100 watt light bulb, it's doing 100 joules of work in one second. Okay. If you get a different light bulb, and it's only 10 watts for the same illumination, then you're 10 times as efficient, right? Because you're only using 10 joules per second, which is why LED bulbs are better than incandescents. Um, however, we usually associate watts with electricity, 
and a different unit when, say, we're talking about the power of a car. What gearheads out there, what do we usually talk about when it comes to the engine output of a car? Horsepower. What the heck is a horsepower? First question, what kind of horse? I've worked with lots of different horses in my life. I was going to say career. I'm not a career horse person. Okay, but in high school, I had I, in summertime working up in Yosemite. I had to work with some horses, and I worked with I worked with big, big draft horses down to riding horses, right? Quarter horses and mustangs and that kind of stuff. I've actually ridden on a, a Icelandic pony, okay, which is basically a big dog, right? There's a lot of variation to what a horse does. The the big Horses that pulled stagecoaches and wagons and stuff like that for the park service. I mean, they're like just basically elephants that look like horses. I mean, it's like 2,500 pounds of animal. One of which is dumber than dirt, okay? And the other one smarter than Einstein. That pair, that pair of horses was hilarious, okay? But it still begs the question, what's a horsepower? Well, it turns out that a horsepower is 746 watts. Okay. It was a unit that was developed at a time when they were still struggling with this concept and idea of like what's energy and power and all this kind of stuff. And in England, they defined a horsepower as 550 feet, uh, 550 pounds through a distance of one foot in one second. So in other words, if an engine or a horse or anything could move 550 pounds through a distance of one foot in one second, they defined that as a standard horsepower and then scaled everything to it. Um, nowadays, horsepower is kind of going out of style. It's still around in car circles, but if you go to like uh, F1 and uh, the uh, Indy 500, uh, NASCAR is now adopting. I know NASCAR, like the most American thing ever, right? Get drunk, run cars in circles, right? It's it, even they are switching away from horsepower to kilowatts. Kilowatts of engine output, okay? Uh, and what's a kilowatt? It's a thousand watt. So um, just a couple of things here with power, right? Work and energy are two sides of the same coin, aren't they? Work is always a change in energy. It's built into that conservation of energy equation where work non-conservative equals delta energy, right? A final minus an initial. So the questions that you'll come up against might ask you, you know, tell you that there's an energy change. Right? In a certain amount of time. That's still power. Or it might be all about the work that something is doing. And since work, by the way, this is definitional, the work is force times distance, isn't it? So you can leave it at that, or you can even take this one step further. What's a distance divided by a time? It's a velocity, isn't it? So you could just do force times speed. As long as those two things are pointing in the same direction, you're going to have the power output. So kind of lots of different ways to get the power. The point is either find a work or a change in energy, which can be the same thing, divide by time. It gives you an idea, right? And the shorter the time for a given amount of energy, the more power output. Think of like jogging versus sprinting. You can jog 100 meters or you can sprint 100 meters. Which one takes more power? The sprint, you're just doing more work in a, like, your 100 meters might be a 15 to 20 second run, whereas if you jogged it, it could take you a minute, right? So it could be the same amount of, like, energy output to go the same distance. It's just that one will require more power than the other. Just kind of weird to think about, but true. So... Power is a pretty straightforward calculation, and I whipped up a quick example for talking about um, or, or, or thinking about power. So I instantly just went to airplanes, okay? 
And this is a this is a uh, airplane called an A330. It's made by Airbus, which is a European French manufacturer. And it's kind of, these planes. So there there used to be big planes like 747s that carried like you know 250 people. They'd have four engines on the wings and all kinds of stuff. Um, Airbus still has a plane that carries 300 people and has four engines, but they're kind of going out of style because this plane right here, which can carry only 200 people. Um, 220 depending on the configuration has those just two engines on it and it can go like <laughs> halfway around the world without refueling like it's nuts how efficient some of these aircraft are compared to earlier models so I went and I pulled out some data okay about what this aircraft's engines are capable of and we're going to try and figure out okay what the power output of these engines are. So directly from the manufacturing specifications, each of these engines can produce 320 kilonewtons of thrust. So that's the amount of force that's being pushed out the back of the engine. That's approximately 70,000 pounds. 70,000 pounds of thrust, right? Backwards, that's what can push it forward. Single engine, and by the way, these things can fly on a single engine, no problem, okay? So, combining those two things together, we get the 640 kilonewtons, okay? And so we're gonna find the combined power output of the engines, right? Um, when it's at its cruise speed. It cruises at about 850 kilometers per hour, which means it's covering about 14 and a half kilometers every minute. 14 and a half kilometers, that's, um, that's like nine miles every minute. This thing moves. So, how are we gonna do this? Find the power, power. Work divided by time, which is force times distance over time. Um, we're, we've been given a velocity of sorts, but let's, let's see if we can't just use it this way. So what, what's the force that's uh, being employed here? It's 640 kilonewtons. So what do we have to do to that number? Not, well, kilo means what? Times 10 to the 3. Like you literally can just replace the K with times 10 to the 3 to get the newtons. Okay. Uh, distance was 14.6 kilometers, kilometers. So what am I going to replace the K with? 10 to the 3. In other words, multiply by 1,000. Uh, okay, and then my time. My time is one minute. What do I have to make sure I do with every single one of these numbers I'm putting in? Get the units to the standard unit, right? If it's not in the standard unit, there's going to be trouble. How many seconds are there in one minute? 60 seconds. That was an easy conversion. Okay, so over here, my force. 640 times 10 to the 3. My distance, 14.6 times 10 to the 3. And my time, 60 seconds. For a total power output of 155 times 10 to the 6 watts. In other words, 155 million watts. 10 to the 6 is million. Which... If you want to know and convert this into horsepower, there are 746 watts in one horsepower. That is equivalent to 209,000 horsepower. Try to put that in a car. <laughs> right? <laughs> in a Civic. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, a Civic's got what, two, three hundred at best, depending on. Well, stock Civic is only like 150, 200, right? Um, some of the world's most powerful cars ha are pushing like 1,000 to 1,200 horsepower, and those are like the, the $400,000 versions of that car, right? So this, this is just, a, <laughs> just another planet as far as, as power is concerned. Just, just an insane amount of incredible engineering that goes into these, to these engines.
Um, in closing, let me ask you a question. Human beings, are we capable of a horsepower? I, okay, let me be very, very clear. I'm not specifically talking about you, right? But human beings in general. Like, has anybody ever seen like a weightlifting competition? Maybe in the Olympics, right? Where they're picking up those weights, right? What's, what's, it, uh, what's it called? Clean and jerk, is that what it is? Where they, where they have to, they have, it's clean, you pull it up, right? And then you can wait as long as you want, but usually you don't wait very long. And then you push it up. That's the jerk, right? Okay, so you clean and then you jerk, right? I'm not, I'm not a bodybuilder, as you can tell. Uh, but like, I, I like watching the Olympics and all different sports. But, but this weightlifter get right, and the, the pull, and like the bar that they're holding on to has got all these weights on it, and like the bar is like bending down on the other side, right? As they hold this thing up, and they got to hold it for a certain amount of time, and then they'll either like step backwards or step forwards to just let it fall down, and they register a minor earthquake in the area, right? Is the right? Okay, I think. I'm not sure what the world record is, but it's 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 over 400 pounds. Might be approaching 500 pounds in the clean and jerk. Okay, so the question is, if one horsepower is 550 pounds through one foot in one second, is an Olympic weightlifter capable of that? Probably, right? Um, but we can we can change this a little bit. What if we lifted 225 pounds? through a distance of two feet. Isn't that the same? Or 112.5 pounds through a distance of four feet? Now you're talking my style, right? Okay. Do you see how you can play with the amount of weight and the amount of distance that needs to be lifted in order to get that 550? And now starts to sound very, very familiar. Indeed, <clears throat> I have measured my horsepower. I was required to in one of my physics labs in college. We had, uh, so my teacher was a, um, a brilliant, brilliant person, and she was also a member of the US beach volleyball team. And she thought physical fitness was a good idea for a bunch of asthmatic nerds in her physics class. And so she made us run up the stairs. Three flights of stairs, okay? And we had to measure the time it took for us to run up the stairs. And we had to, and then we were working against our own body weight, right? So known body weight, known time, and we, most of us, those of us that didn't collapse from asthma, were able to get about a horsepower. Some a little under, some a little over, okay? But it could happen. One of the students in the class got it into his head that he wanted to get two horsepower, and he was on the football team. Like, he was amazing, right? He was physically fit, strong, handsome. He was different from us in a lot of different ways. One key way is that he had a girlfriend. So, like, you know, it was, it, he was amazing, right? He knew how to do math. It was really annoying. And um, he got in his head that he wanted to get two horsepower. And he was getting, like, 1.7. And so he enlisted my help in increasing his weight by making me ride on his back as he ran up the stairs because I was the smallest person in the room. I've never been more scared for my life in my career than when I was riding his back up three flights of stairs, right? And, and the problem was he was using his hands to pull himself up with the handrails, right? And he was running. And so I... The only thing I had to hold on to was his neck, <laughs> right? And I was like, so how are you going to breathe? He's like, don't worry about that. <laughs> but yeah, I think that day he managed to get 2.1 horsepower. So, so human beings are, are capable. You are capable of horsepower. With, with five minutes of training, I can get you to horsepower, no problem. Some of you are like, no, Mr. Bale, ain't gonna happen today. <laughs> but human beings on jet, but what's the difference between you and a horse? Obvious anatomical differences aside. 
Waste. You can both do a horsepower, but how long can you do a horsepower compared to how long a horse can do a horsepower? A horse, a horse can do a horsepower all day long. Like, you give them water, alfalfa, some oats, they're like, okay, okay, let's go do this thing, right? You tell a human being to do a horsepower for more than like 30 seconds, they die. So, yeah. Question. That's the final number. Is that 500 or 550? I'm going to hard pass on the 209,000? Yeah. It's a 209,000. Yeah, those are all zeros. Sorry. Yeah, one of those looks like a five, doesn't it? More than one looks like a five. Yeah. Have a great party weekend.